Fake Naders, mount up. I'd like to welcome Larry Brown, founder and editor in chief of Larry Brown Sports. If you aren't familiar, Larry Brown Sports is an entertaining sports site featuring funny pictures, amusing videos, witty sarcasm, offbeat stories, and influential opinions. Larry, how is it going? Going great. I think that's a lot to live up to. I didn't realize that my self-proclaimed title for the website was like so involved. I don't even know if I can do all of that too either. <laughs> nice. So I wanted to have you on because you put out great sports content and you've been in the sports media industry for 14 years. There's a lot of people out there that dream of being a sports writer or owning their own site. And I want to hear about your experiences and things that you've learned. But... Before we get that, I often like to start my videos by asking the guest who their hashtag random athlete of the day is. This can be any athlete ever, whoever comes to the top of your mind. So who's your hashtag random athlete of the day? Ah, uh, let's see. First athlete that just comes to mind for me would be Bo Jackson right behind me. Um, he's on my wall for a reason. Greatest athlete of all time. Love the guy. He was an all-star in baseball, a pro bowler in football without even having a preseason. The guy was insane. Uh, I am Club Bo. I am also Club Bo. Uh, I actually, my AL Only Fantasy Baseball League, our trophy is a signed Bo Jackson Royals jersey. Nice. So I'm also Team Bo. Uh, for me, my hashtag random athlete of the day is former Florida State running back Edgar Bennett. Wow. Uh so former getting this Green bad boy Bay started back too, right? What was that? Former Green Bay Packers running back too. You got that right. So I wanted to get this started uh, on a random note. I saw that as a kid, you were at a taping of Wheel of Fortune. That must have been awesome, right? Holy crap. How the heck did you find that out? Yes. I, I did go to one and I remember going with one of my friends in elementary school. And the big draw, of course, when you're really young and going to see a taping of Wheel of Fortune is going to see the dang wheel, right? Right. And then it turns out to be the size of like a little chocolate cake, just like a little apple pie. It was tiny and we couldn't believe it. Biggest disappointment of my life as a third grader was learning that the wheel from Wheel of Fortune was like this big. You can make it in the size of like a chicken pot pie. That's how tiny it was. Wow. I was expecting like monster truck size. Yeah, it was tiny. It was tiny. And you, my friend, have done your research. I don't know how the heck you came up with that. Uh, well, I mean, I, I'm looking for something good to build this rapport. And I was like, Wheel of Fortune. I was like, my goodness. Did you get to see Vanna White? I believe, yeah, I believe so at the time. And this is uh, back in Vanna White's prime when she was like a nice pop culture reference. Like, I think these days, if you drop a Vanna White on people, it will just like pff, go over their heads. But back then she was like in her prime and yeah, she was there. All right, so uh, let's start at the very beginning. What was your first job or gig that you got in sports and how did you land it? Uh, woo. Well, if we're going to straight sports, my first gig would have been as a baseball camp counselor uh, during the summer when I was in middle school and I was getting paid practically slave wages, $15 a day. So probably broke out to like two bucks an hour. But aside from that, in sports media, the first thing I ever did was intern at Fox Sports Radio, their national network. And that's located in, Lo in Los Angeles. Uh, Fox has a bunch of sports properties in LA. So my first gig was interning for Fox Sports Radio, their national network. Um, I got that one because it just randomly opened up pretty close by where I grew up. And uh, it used to be the location for the radio studios it used to be a Denny's restaurant, okay? And then it went out of business. They converted it to radio studios. And my mom kept recommending to me and suggesting to me, hey, have you gotten into Fox Sports Radio yet? You know, why don't you drop in there? Um, you know, try and do something. So at some point in high school one day, I finally went by, literally knocked on the door outside the studios. Someone let me in and, uh, you know, I kind of schmoozed with them a little bit. He gave me the contact info for the person who sets up internships. So I set one up and uh, after my freshman year of college, um, I interned there and that was my first experience in sports was interning there and um i really tried to treat it pretty uh you know with a purpose like 
I really want to work in sports. So I tried to learn everything possible, um, every single role that they have at the station. I tried to learn it. And that was kind of a gateway for me because after my internship ended, they gave me, offered me a position as a part-time weekend editor. And uh, that was my uh, first start into sports media. And was this pre or early internet? Uh, this was back in like 2002. Uh, so the internet was still around, but if I recall correctly, um, it wasn't the number one resource when uh, radio hosts were on air. I don't think uh, connections were that great then. Um, except actually back in my dorm room at UCLA though, it was pretty sweet. We we were on those like T3 lines. Yeah. Um, so you could uh, download movies in a second. Don't tell anyone I said that though. Right. That was back in the day of Napster and all those uh, streaming things. <clears throat> oh yeah. Oh yeah. Like uh, Netzilla or I, I forgot w which one, one of those was called, but yeah. So was there any discomfort on your end, literally going up and knocking on the door, especially just being a high schooler where uh, you're knocking on Fox Sports door. It's almost like this big monster and here comes you as this kid and you're not used to, you're not as savvy as you are now. Oh, definitely. Like I put this off for a good couple of months and my mom, you know, thankfully she, she kept pushing me. She was, you know, kept reminding me, hey, have you gone in there? She kept encouraging me to stop by. And then finally one day I was in like a really good mood. I think I had just played a baseball game. I think we had probably won or something. And I was like, today is the day I'm going to do it. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. Like I avoided it for a while because how do you do that? It's like when you have a crush on a girl for a couple of months, you're carrying it around for a while. Like, and then you finally get the courage to ask her out. Like I would, I would put it on par with that. Definitely really nervous about it. So let this be a testament to all of you who want to do something, but are holding off on doing it and taking that first step because all it takes is one step and look at where knocking on that door landed you right now. So let's fast forward to the first day you started Larry Brown Sports. Tell me about that day. Uh, so I guess around 2000, 2005 is when I graduated college. And uh, at that point, I was still working for Fox Sports Radio. I wasn't a full-time employee at the time, but I was getting enough hours where I was pretty much, um, you know, making full-time type money. So that was really my gig, but I wanted to do a lot more than that. Um, so I started getting involved with a couple of websites and doing some uh, sports writing for them, hosting podcasts, things like that. And then I decided it was time for me to kind of launch my own website. And this was around 2006. Um, at the time, I think Deadspin had just kind of started. Um, so this was the beginning of like the sports blog era. And at the time, sports sites like sportsbybrooks.com and benmaller.com were a couple of the real popular sports ones. Um, and the concept of a blog was really new. So kind of similar to the way Sports by Brooks had his site and Ben Maller had his, kind of people were doing it like in this vanity way, naming it after themselves. And I'm not that creative of a person. I couldn't think of a good name like Bacon Sports. So for me, I knew my name was never going to change. So I just named my site LarryBrownSports.com. And throughout 2006, I was kind of working with someone to set up the site for me, exchanging some ideas like, this is what I want it to look like. These are some of the features I'd like for it. And he was building it, but it was going pretty slowly. And I wasn't really happy with the lack of progress. So then finally one day I was just like, enough of this, I'm gonna figure it out myself. Um, and it wasn't that easy back then. This is very early 2007, January 2007. This is almost, I guess, nine years ago. It wasn't that easy to start a website. And I decided, forget it. I'm just going to do it myself today. And I just started doing it and uh, finally launched the site as an actual blog with a WordPress theme. Um, you know, those first couple months, like if you go back and read some of those early posts, man, like it's pretty apparent. I didn't know exactly what I was doing, but over time I was able to uh, figure it out. And actually one thing that really helped uh, me improve my blogging skills and just gain a better understanding of things was I was one of the early writers at AOL Sports' fan house. Um, so I learned a lot about photo cropping, techniques for blogging, how SEO work, things like that, that I brought over to Larry Brown Sports that helped me on with that as well.
I, uh, I feel you on the web design thing. Back in the day, I actually taught myself HTML and built my own Angel Fire website. Oh, goodness Lord, yes. Um, these kids nowadays probably have no idea what it's like to have to do the HTML or like back in the day when you actually had to upgrade WordPress, which is, you know, the CMS, the content managing system in the back, like that used to be a really big deal. It wasn't so easy as just like, Hey, click a button. Let's update to the new one. This was like, you got to back up the entire website and hope and pray that uh, your website didn't go down and you lost all your data when you would upgrade. Yeah, it, that HTML stuff, it was tough. So let's talk about the AOL Fan House gig. So how did, how did that come about? I think at some point I found out that uh, they were starting a site um, and, and looking for some writers. I think maybe at the time Jamie Mottram was actually a blogger himself. Maybe I kind of followed some of his stuff, heard about it. I think it went like that. Um, and then I just kind of, you know, I was like, this is something I want to get involved in. I was trying to do anything and everything possible. Um, at the same time that I was working at Fox Sports Radio, you know, I felt like I had a lot more to offer and I wanted, I was really hungry. I wanted to do a lot of things. So at that time, like, I, I, I would say I worked no less than like three different jobs at a time. Like I was also writing for MLB.com, doing some stuff for MLB TV. Um, you know, I was doing a bunch of things on the side. And so I think I found out that Jamie Mottram was starting Fan House. And I was like, forget this. I'm just going to reach out to him and, and put myself out there. Let him know what my specialty is, where I think I would fit in. And, uh, you know, I kind of did it that way. And I reached out to him and I knew he was starting something. I think they had already launched the NFL Fan House like in the fall. I was like, you guys haven't done your baseball yet. I would love to do baseball. I could, I'm, I'm in Los Angeles. I could be your West Coast guy. I'll do the AL West. I'll cover the AL West and NL West teams. And uh, maybe he looked at my site. Maybe he didn't. But I think by me throwing it in his lap made it a lot easier for him to take a chance on me. Um, and I remember getting that email saying, hey, you have been hired. And it was a really cool feeling. Um, back in the day, they only paid like seven fifty dollars per, per story or something like that. It was wasn't very much. I was only making a couple hundred bucks a month off of it, but it was nice exposure. Um, a lot of the people who I worked with at Fan House, you know, have become pretty prominent writers and bloggers uh, since then. Um, you know, I learned a lot and it was a good experience. And I think that's how I got started with it. Yeah. And as a, on my end, I can certainly uh, attest to that of just trying to get out there anywhere, get writing. I know for me, I wrote for sports websites for years upon years without even getting paid because a lot of people want to get a job. Oh, I want to be a sports writer. Well, how in the world are you going to get hired to do a skill if you're not currently doing anything to say, this is what I've done. It's no different than if you want to get a job in marketing, sales, HR, they're going to say, what have you done to be able to bring to the table to show me that you can do what you say you're going to do? Absolutely. It's amazing. Um, a lot of people like, you know, Steve Del Vecchio, who writes for my site currently, he's, he's been full time with me for like three, four years now. When he first started off, I mean, he reminded me of this a couple months back when he first started off for me, he was writing for me for 50 bucks a month because that's all I could pay him at the time because the website was just a part time thing on the side when I was full time in radio. Um, so I didn't have a whole lot of money to pay him, but he kind of proved himself with a good work ethic um, that he was, you know, willing to do more. And the more he put in, you know, the more results we start to see, the more I was able to start paying him and it paid off in the end. I think a lot of people don't really look at things long term. They just look at what you're just paying them in the, you know, immediately. Um, and, and they get discouraged by that and they don't realize how it could become a long term benefit. Um, and I understand, I guess, because there are some sites that it doesn't matter how much you do for them or how long you, you work for them. They're never going to bump you up to that full time position. So I get sometimes where people are coming from, but uh, you know, you got to start off somewhere. And if that means working for free for a little bit, to me, I think um, the more you show that you're willing to do it and that you're a hard worker, I think the better it is for you in the end. I think it's going, going to pay off uh, most of the time. Certainly. I mean, we're, we're talking opportunity here. The option is create it yourself or go do it with somebody else who's going to give you the tools to succeed. And a lot of people get stuck in that little thing of, 
I need to get paid in order to be able to do this. Trust me, we all want to get paid. I would love to pay people great salaries to be able to do this, but this is also uh, not the easiest model and industry to break through, especially with the amount of other companies that are out there who have more resources, all the things in a very commoditized industry. Definitely. And I think really the industry has changed in that sense where, you know, I started the site in 2007. It was hard to get really hard to get exposure back then. Um, but maybe from around like 2009 to 2011, around that range or, you know, 2009, 2010 to 2012, um, I think it was a little easier to get exposure if you're doing good things because sites were willing to link to each other, send each other traffic. Um, if you wrote a good story, you could get it, you know, linked on maybe SI.com's hot clicks or, you know, Deadspin will refer some traffic. So you could kind of get a little exposure that way. People have blog roles on the side of their website where they would, you know, list their favorite websites. Um, so in that sense, there was more community within uh, sports blogs. And so you could kind of build a name that way. Um, but then, like you said, things became, uh, you know, corporations, which five years ago were afraid to touch some stories or thought they were silly they weren't really doing the kinds of stories they're doing now they they would leave they would hold off on those they were still in that old school media mindset and they're like oh memes are oh, we're not going to touch that stuff that's silly um and they wouldn't really cover that sort of thing but nowadays you see espn's doing it uh, fox sports doing it you know si has been doing it for a while yahoo sports has their sports blogs set up um newspapers are doing it now there's a million viral sites that are covering things sporting news you know, USA Today, all the corporate brands are in the game and they're competing with sports blogs for the same stories. And where this used to be kind of like sports bloggers turf, um, it's been invaded and now it's just free for everyone. Everyone kind of realized this is where the web is and uh, it's a lot harder to break in now, I would say, for that reason. Well, yeah, it's almost a factory out there. So now if you think about it, the core of why we do what we do is because we love sports, or at least for me, I'm a creator. I love doing this. So I want to naturally create. Then you can get other sites out there, almost like Bleacher Report, who can just say, let's turn this into a model, churn and burn. How many people can we get in here? How many articles? How can we uh, SEO this thing? How can we get the right headlines and everything? And now you're getting this mix and confluence of business meets sports blog and passion and where does it intersect and who knows what's good and what's bad and all that absolutely and i'm just like you when i started off the site for me it was a creative outlet to get my voice out there because at the time i was working in radio i was behind the scenes i felt like i had a lot more to offer I wanted to host radio shows. I wanted to get my voice out there. And I thought, what better way than by starting a site? And then I kind of quickly realized that, um, you know, you don't exactly build a successful site by just offering nothing but opinions. You got to have entertaining content. You got to make it fun. You got to have some of that viral stuff to bring people in. And then you could also mix in your opinion as well, um, you know, and become a personality as well. So I tried to, to mix it up and learn that. But yeah, when I started this site, it was just like you. It's a, it's a passion thing. It's because I love sports. I want to get my voice out there. I want to comment on sports. And that's what the site was designed for. For me, I never, ever had a vision of doing it full time. I never thought I'd be making my living at this. Um, and I might have approached things slightly differently uh, if that were my overall vision and goal when I started dating. You're right. There are sites that have come along. Um, and they have made business plans for, hey, this is how we're going to build a site. We're going to build this huge network. We're going to roll it back into one site. We're going to have booming SEO. We're going to get all kinds of free labor in the form of volunteers. And then we're going to take over the world. And I never really had that vision. It wasn't until somewhat, you know, more recently that I became full time with it and actually decided, hey, I got to run this like a business too, even though it is something that I do out of passion. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a different thing. And if you're doing it out of passion, it is hard to compete with a lot of these people who have overhead costs, who have corporations and who are, you know, reading up on all the industry news and trying to keep up with it. It's, it's tough to compete with that. And I think one issue is trying to keep up with the Joneses. You see how often other people post, you see how big their social media followings are and everything, and you can get discouraged. Uh, I always like to, when I talk in interviews, talk about the first hundred page views you get ever. 
Like that first hundred is just, oh, it is so difficult. You're like, man, when am I going to get to a hundred? Once your friends and family are done reading, you're like, listen, I can't rely on them if I'm going to build this into something successful. Oh man, I remember like AdSense at first, like, you know, just getting like a couple hundred impressions or something. Oh my God, I think AdSense, you know, Google's like, uh, proprietary advertising platform. I think their minimum threshold before they finally pay you. I think you have to earn like a hundred bucks or fifty bucks or something like that. And I remember running Google AdSense ads on my site for months, months before I finally reached the point where they could actually pay me that first check. It was like eight months before I finally got up to a hundred bucks or whatever their minimum is finally got that money it is so hard at first to start a site and build an audience and like you said get that first 100 page views or just get it beyond just friends and family it's really hard to to get to that point but I, I, you know and, and like you said compete with people who have huge social media followings you know it, it's hard it's really hard to do but the bottom line is you know you find something you're good at and you just keep doing it and you know what, eventually over time, you'll build that audience. People will start to see that you're doing something good on a daily, regular basis, and you just stay stay with it, get after it. And I think things do start to work out as long as you work smartly and consistently. I think it does uh, pay off. Persistence and passion. You are certainly right, my friend. All right, what is a typical day like for you from when you wake up until when you go to bed? A lot of hours go into uh, into doing this. Um, you know, I'm always checking up on what the daily stories are, what the news is. Um, I get uh, I subscribe to a couple of Twitter accounts and get them uh, sent to my phone via SMS. So I'm kind of plugged into a few of the important ones, important Twitter accounts. That way, I'm getting news fed to me. Um, I still actually subscribe to RSS feeds and have an RSS reader. Um, I go through that for stories. I log into Twitter. I follow a lot of people. Um, and I, I don't like to rely on other big sites to find the stories and, and kind of like, you know, and take the, my cue from them. Um, I am following people kind of like on the ground level where I'm able to identify the story as it's happening, publish it. And I'm hoping that other big sites see the news through me and they missed it elsewhere. Um, so. You know, I'm going through Twitter, I'm going through my RSS feeds, going through all of that. I'm writing, I'm blogging, doing all of that. Um, but I'm also managing the site at a site-wide level. So as an editor, um, you know, I'm checking our homepage to make sure the right stories are featured in our featured spots, in our headline spots. Um, you know, I, I check our Facebook group and, you know, I want to see what the best stories are to share on social media. Uh, so I look into all of that kind of stuff. Um, I'm checking some of our business stuff. How's traffic doing? How's it looking? Um, you know, how are, are our ads performing? Um, you know, I start, you know, I correspond with uh, some of the other people who write for the site, you know, maybe talk with them about what stories they're planning on doing. And, you know, I, I get to it and I start blogging away and I am kind of just dialed in uh, for, for the whole day, just, you know, locked into Twitter. I got, you know, if games are on, I got games on. Um, and I'm just trying to, uh, write some stories, but, and, and then there's a lot of stuff that deals with the business side too. Always getting offers, always getting like marketing promotions, people who want to partner up for ad networks, um, you know, people who want to promote a product, um, you know, maybe suggesting interviews, things like that. So I have to sift through a lot of that. And it's just kind of a long day of, you know, being plugged in and making sure everything's operating well. And, um, I'm always looking in and constantly seeing whether or not there are areas we can improve. Like, do we need to do more with social media? Are we lacking there? Are we lacking in terms of, uh, are we not getting a, enough stories via search engines? Um, are our ads not performing well? Do we need to tweak something there? There's a lot of tweaking, a lot of maintenance. There's constantly a search for what can we do better? And I'm keeping all of that in mind while trying to produce content throughout the day. So, one uh, marketing opportunity that I know you are probably very excited to hear from is Ram Trucks, where you got to interview Dan Patrick. Go to the Sportsman Cave in Milford. I have to imagine that was the most amazing thing ever. What I want to know is specifically, you got to ask Dan a question about 
uh, interviewing people. Uh, what are the keys to doing great interviews? What was his response? Yeah, that was a, that was a fun time. Um, I think one thing with Dan, he just is so good at establishing rapport with people, you know, um, and he's, he's really good about doing that. He really brings them into his, you know, cocoon. He's, he's really cool about that. He connects with them on a level where you feel like it's just you and him and no one else is watching or listening. And that's what he's so good at. And I remember him, uh, describing it. He said, that when he has like for instance when he brings reggie miller onto his show he wants it to feel like he is having a phone call privately with reggie miller and his audience is just eavesdropping into that and he's so good at making it feel like it's really comfortable it's a comfortable setting a comfortable environment i don't know that i would say he disarms you but he just makes you really feel comfortable at ease like you're just a couple of pals hanging out talking and that style um leads to probably people and interview subjects feeling more comfortable and they're giving you more information and they feel looser and you just don't even realize it it's kind of like talking with howard stern the next thing you know you're just telling him your whole life history when you lost your virginity and everything like that you never really intended to do that but they connect with you so well and get so personal with you that you just start uh, letting it all fly. And that's what he does really well is he just breaks it down and really connects with people and um, makes it seem like he's just having a conversation with them on the phone. Yeah, I watch DP every day and I try and, I obviously I love it, but I also try and learn and you just see the pace and the cadence the familiarity and you want to be a part of that. And those fundamentals are everything that I'm looking to build uh, with bacon sports and everything that I'm doing. So uh, what do people on the outside not realize about running your own site? Aside from all the information overload, the number of things that you have to do, the 24 seven sports media landscape where literally uh, I almost have to slow myself down because it's information in business and task overload that there's so many things you want to do. There's so many things that really you, in your, in my mind, I can see where you can have a hundred people working on various things and there's still not enough things to get done. Oh, absolutely. Like there are always so many more stories out there that I want to write about that I don't get to write about. And at some point you just have to kind of let them go and just say, all right, there's only so much time I have in the day. There's only so many stories I can do. Got to let some of them go. Um, I think one thing for me that I always remind myself, you know, now, now that I've been doing it full time for maybe around five years or so, or I guess a little more than that, is I constantly remind myself, you know, it's, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. You know, I'm in, in, in this for the long haul. Um, I'm not trying to burn myself out. You know, I think for bloggers, I think a lot of people suffer from burnout because in order to keep up with the industry, you got to be online, plugged in and, and buy media all the time because you never know when news is going to happen. Like, you know, it could be a Sunday morning at 7 a.m. and Lane Kiffin gets fired on the tarmac of an airport. You got to be around to cover it. Uh, it could be a Friday freaking night and uh, Mac Brown just got uh, hired by Alabama to replace Nick Saban, who's now going to Texas. You got to be around for that. And it, you have to be around all the time to cover things or risk falling behind. Um, so there's a lot of pressure to be plugged in at all times. It's easy to suffer from burnout if you force yourself to be inside around your computer, tied into this all the time, putting in multiple hour days. Uh, well beyond the eight hour a days. Um, and when you're doing that, you can burn out pretty quickly. And I think a lot of people who have their own sites in order to keep up, were doing that and burned out. And that's why a lot of blogs that you saw around, you know, three, four years ago might not exist anymore because people suffer from that burnout. So for me, I will put in long days, but I still try and have some balance. You know, I always try and work out, get some exercise, um, try and get out of the house a little bit, you know, can't be plugged in all the time um, and you know set some limits so I'm not burning out um, but one thing that is really important though is to have that consistency whether you have 
uh, a video cast, whether you have a show, uh, you know, a podcast, whether you have a site, you have to have consistency so people know what they can expect. They don't ever want to come to your site and not see new content. You always have to have a reason for people to keep coming back. You have to be consistent. You're never going to build an audience if you just have one good story and then you never blog for another week. Or if you start a podcast, you deliver it you know, for a month straight, people start to get into it, they like it, and then you disappear for three months. It's really hard to get those people back. You have to be very consistent. Once you decide you're going to do something, you know, for me, if I'm going to take on an endeavor with my site, if I want to try to develop a new feature, if I'm thinking about doing a podcast or a show or something like that, I have to have, make sure it's well thought out. For me, I try to make sure it's well thought out and I know I can deliver on it on a consistent basis for a long time because that's the only way you can actually build an audience is by doing it consistently where people know that when they come back, they are going to regularly see new fresh content and to me that's a major major uh factor yeah i think you nailed it right there it's why it's why so many people end up quitting this it's uh just like the marathon you gotta take one more step take one more step one more step just keep going keep going keep going because that's uh how people end up making it so what advice would you give someone who wants to work in sports media one day, whether this is a college kid who's graduating, someone who's 35 and in a sales job they hate, uh, and they say, man, I can't believe that Larry Brown gets to do this as his job. He's probably had everything made for him or whatever. It's like, if you can say, listen, man, if I can tell you one thing aside from the, the bevy of awesome nuggets you've already dropped on us now, what, what would you say? Listen, man, do this. Here's my advice for you. I always say that one thing you have to do is figure out how you're going to differentiate yourself from everyone else. What makes you different? What makes you better? What makes you, you know, this sounds corny. What makes you special? Like what makes you different from everyone else out there on Twitter? What makes your website different from everyone else? What makes your podcast different? What makes your video cast different from everyone else out there who's already doing something? And I can't tell each individual what they do differently or what their strengths are, but there are so many different ways to differentiate yourself. Do you just happen to have a much stronger knowledge base about a given team than everyone else? You know, is your team the Dodgers and you just know that team inside and out? Can you build a following just by focusing on the Dodgers and being better than everyone about it? Do you go to a school uh, do you go to Ohio State University and do you have a relationship with the athletes that nobody else has? Does that give you access to breaking news that no one else has where you can build an audience that way? What about you differentiates yourself from everything else out there that currently exists and how can you do all of that um, and create something that will help you stand out? And to me, it's about what do you do that differentiates yourself that improves what's already out there that's different from what's already out there that's better than what's already out there and once you can figure that out identify it and develop it and run with it that's the key to breaking in in my opinion all right so you're gonna be the first one that i did this with uh we're gonna go with the lightning slash speed round haven't come up with a creative name for it yet but just to get a little bit uh, to know you a little bit more, and we will end with this. You can only choose one, bacon, sports, or beer. Ooh, for me, that one is going to be sports because sadly, I actually have Crohn's disease, so that kind of limits the things I can drink and eat. So that's an easy one for me. It's, it's sports for me. Back in the day, though, when I was drinking more beer and that was okay with my system, like a glass of Newcastle and sports put together was like pretty perfect. All right, you can be buried in only one sports jersey. What is it? For me, that's going to be my Angels jersey, and it's going to be my Garrett Anderson 2002 Los Angeles, or back then, Anaheim Angels World Series jersey. It has the patch from when they won the World Series. He was my favorite player. He retired, so it makes me feel super old now, but uh, that's what it is, my authentic Garrett Anderson Angels jersey. Nice. Garrett Anderson, almost like a poor-ish, similar man to Bernie Williams. 
very much so and you know stuck with the the one team for a really long time just a fan favorite type of guy got it done love him all right uh who is the greatest nfl running back ever well I, i'm partial to bo jackson love him but i never saw him play but the numbers kind of bear it out i would say jim brown i mean his numbers are sick i think he played nine seasons eight of the nine he led the league in rushing the guy is still respected by everyone out there he was awesome i'm going with jim brown all right what is the most memorable game you've ever been to live okay that that one is along the same lines as being buried in my garrett anderson jersey game seven 2002 my team the angels are at home in the World Series, do or die against the San Francisco Giants. My dad and I got tickets to that game. And at the time, this is 2002, I was just a sophomore in college. I think it was uh, $200 tickets, which at the time seemed like a lot. Nowadays, I think people pay 200 bucks just to sit in nosebleeds for an NFL game. Um, so we were sitting beyond the bullpen in left field, watching the Giants and the Angels. I was there in game seven, my favorite athlete of all time, uh, or favorite baseball player of all time, Garrett Anderson, smacks a bases clearing double that made the difference in the game. He got the big hit. Watching my team win the World Series, their only championship in person, nothing can top that. Wow. All right. Last question. You get to play a round of golf with any three athletes ever. Who is joining you in your foursome? Ooh. Let's see. All right, we got to have someone who spices things up. Um, so I think Broadway Joe might be in that group because that guy just is awesome. And uh, he's got to bring his coat, though. That's like a must. Broadway Joe has to bring his coat. So probably Broadway Joe. Are we going all time here? Like, can they be deceased? Okay. Anywhere you want to go with this. All right, actually... I'm going to actually include Wade Boggs into this because there's like stories yes. out there that the guy crushed a hundred beers on plane flights after ball games. I have to see if that's true. Okay. I got to see if Wade Boggs can drink a hundred beers during a round of golf. We got to see if that's going to happen. And then number three, this one is for pure entertainment purposes. Charles Barkley. I got to see that golf swing up close and personal, and you know he's going to keep it funny and awesome. So Chuck's got to be there. Certainly. And that 19th hole with Chuck, no doubt, would be amazing. All right, Larry, uh, time for you to plug some stuff. What do you got going on in Larry Brown Sports? Plug anything that you would like. Uh, well, LarryBrownSports.com is the website where, you know, hopefully people visit, get entertained there, um, enjoy what we do. And I think most people will. Um, you can follow me on Twitter, Twitter.com slash LB Sports. We have a Facebook page, uh, Facebook.com slash Larry Brown Sports, a YouTube channel. Got all that good stuff going on. Um, going to be probably diving into uh, Snapchat a little bit. Yes, some going the way of the teenagers. Got to keep up with all the evolving media. We're not ready for that just yet, but keep on the lookout. And yeah, LarryBrownSports.com is the place. Uh, I can tell you, I've been on Snapchat for a while. And as a creator, I absolutely love it. Uh, Snapchatted the entire SEC road trip that I was just on. And I didn't even remember most of it, not because we were wasted, just because it's nice after an entire day of tailgating to go back and be like, whoa, there's nine minutes of what we were doing. So uh, I think it'll be a great thing for your audience to engage with you. So I really appreciate you taking the time uh, to jump on the podcast. Hopefully uh, people learned a lot about Larry Brown sports and what it takes to make it in sports media. So uh, I thank you, my friend. Thanks for having me on. This was fun. I enjoyed it.